monarch. Well, I think the royal family has to modernise and develop as it goes along, and it has to stay relevant. The Queen is a fantastic role model to lead that, and that's the challenge for me. We are on the verge of the historic royal wedding, and at the centre of the action is a soon-to-be American princess. I put a spell on you. I think on the wedding day, as Meghan walks down the aisle and the choir's singing, because you'll be able to hear the distant hum of Edward VIII spinning in his grave because he gave up the throne to marry a twice-divorced American. But now Meghan Markle, she's American, she's biracial, she's been divorced, and she's allowed to marry a royal. How exactly did we get here? It's been... It's going to be a very difficult juggling act. Maybe things have moved slowly in the past, but they're certainly not moving slowly now. There is only one job that the royal family has. There's a lot of duty, there's a lot of protocol, there are a lot of expectations, but only one job survive and for a thousand plus years no family has been better at surviving nobody's joking about the handbag anymore nobody's joking about the hats anymore there's queen elizabeth you know keep on keeping on oh really please Boom. the births and the marriages the love stories when they flourish or when they fail it's the greatest reality show in the world americans can't get enough of it Unlike the Kardashians, this soap opera has got a heritage. They should be a little bit removed. That makes them special. But that doesn't mean that they should be untouchable. The royal family are changing with the times. You trace that all the way back to Princess Diana. There was something magic about Diana right from the start. People just fell in love with her. I think there was almost a worship for her. Women are generally not encouraged to be rebels. Traditionally, they're encouraged to be silent, just do what they are told. That, of course, was not Diana. She was the golden goose. To express its emotions. And there were scenes I'll never forget. And I gave it this big injection of star power, and then she lobbed a couple of grenades into it. There's no mistress in the fairy tale. This is where the fairy tale cracks, and reality comes in. And everybody believed everything that Diana said, that Camilla had wrecked the marriage, destroyed Diana's happiness. The death of Diana, that was probably the lowest moment for Queen Elizabeth. The British public in London were just going crazy, going, you know, where is the Queen? People really started wondering if the monarchy would survive. And now we have a new cast of characters. There's been a reboot. And people are tuning in. And that tune-in equates to billions of dollars. William and Harry were famous since the day they were born. So they grew up in this, this reality that they couldn't get out of. I don't think I'd want to Prince William because everything has to be perfect. Prince Harry knows he's not going to be the next king, so he can do what he wants. They are the future of this institution. The Queen is allowing the royal family to modernize and to rebrand, if you like. Even 10 years ago, if people had said, well, just wait till Harry comes along with a divorced American of mixed birth. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's not gonna happen. When the engagement happened, there was this sort of outcry of, of racism. How much of a sense did you have, Megan, of the enormity of what you were getting into? I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like brand, popular opinion, staying relevant, staying global, is absolutely what the British royal family is about. Because, of course, if you lose that, then the British monarchy will fall. This is an institution that's got, on the horizon, a major brand crisis. And William, 
carry are the best hope they have of surviving that crisis. These are icons. They want to be like them, they want to feel like them, they want to look like them. When Meghan Markle wears something, it sells out like this. This will be like one of the only ways that you can get a selfie with them, stand next to them and see them in real life. So, well, real life. <laughs> The British royal family are at the highest point they've been in many a long year. And programmes like The Crown have brought a new generation to appreciate the royal family. There is something magic about, about royalty. It's really an American obsession with the Disney version of the monarchy. It's close enough that we can imagine maybe we could see ourselves in that world, but just out of reach so that we're always curious Elizabeth has kept the crown viable going into the 21st century. That was by no means guaranteed. These are extraordinary scenes, and the crowd here along this stretch of the river are lining up eight deep, and this basically goes on for seven miles. The royal celebration underway across the pond this evening. Four days of parties now marking Queen Elizabeth's diamond jubilee, 60 years on the throne. They carried the queen on a tide of devotion. A monarch whose popularity, it seems, has never been greater. Certainly for someone of my generation, but I think younger generations too, it's very difficult to imagine Britain without Queen Elizabeth II. I've been with her all my life, and I've watched her all through everything, and I think she's amazing. She's done an incredible job. She's been our queen for 60 years, and I don't think we realise how much she is just absolutely loved. This is a woman who is literally seen every key figure of the second half of the 20th century. Queen Elizabeth oversees hundreds of charitable organizations. She's been at the heart of huge international political events and is probably the most politically accomplished person in the world. The queen, though, wasn't supposed to be queen. She was queen because her uncle, Edward VIII, had abdicated. Edward VIII was the eldest son of George V. He was meant to be the, the king following his father's death in 1936. He was quite good looking, dashing, a rather popular figure, Edward. He was at the center of American and British socialites. He was the heart of the party. He was incredibly popular, very charismatic, but he was weak. His own courtiers were struck at how emotionally underdeveloped he was. And along comes this extremely chic, ambitious woman. Wallace Simpson was a twice divorced American from Baltimore. Very practical person, quite tough by all accounts, was something of a social climber and was very interested in making the acquaintance of Edward. There's a lot of really interesting speculation about the kind of psychosexual hold that she had on him. And because she was domineering, she feels some need that he had to be mothered. Everything had been kept under wraps. The British public didn't know too much. The monarchy had a tacit agreement between the British press that intimate details of a monarch's life. People were fascinated by him. And she, in her own right, had her own luggage. So people were fascinated by her and how she managed to bag the greatest bachelor in the world. The American press had been obsessed with the idea that Edward VIII would marry an American woman. William Randolph Hearst did not like the British monarchy. He really made it a practice to encourage his reporters and photographers to seek out the private lives of the royal family. One of the photographs that drew attention was a photograph of her touching his arm. Ordinary people do not touch the monarch. That kind of intimate gesture indicated that there was an intimate relationship. A cruise he took in 1936 along the Mediterranean coast with Mrs. Simpson. They took photographs in his bathing suit. You could see his chest. I mean, he was half naked in these photographs. The public had never seen its monarch in a photograph in anything less than an utterly dignified manner. 
Edward VIII was one of the first victims of the paparazzi. It was becoming increasingly impossible to keep this secret from the British public. What was it? Hark the herald angels sing, Wallace Simpson's pinched off a king, they or something. <laughs> An American divorcee was going to marry the King of England. This was the scandal of the century. It was the divorce bit that people objected to, not her. There was a real taboo about, about divorce. And so Edward had to choose the woman he loved or his country. abdication was something you couldn't think of the king stepping down and going abroad to marry this woman. One cannot overstate the trauma of the abdication crisis. It seemed at the time that the monarchy, the British monarchy in 1936, came close to self-destructing. Had he insisted on marrying Mrs. Simpson and had Parliament said no, it would have forced a standoff that the country had not seen since the 17th century. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor, that I have found it impossible not of the woman I love. From that moment onwards, the name of Edward VIII, his presence hovering in exile with this wicked American divorcee, it loomed over so many decisions of the royal family. Knowing what we know now, it is incredibly fortunate he abdicated. After they married, they actually paid a visit to Germany and met Hitler. Edward could be useful to them in the event that Germany invaded England and needed some way to rule it. It raised real concerns there is a real chance that the course of history could have been changed had he stayed on the throne. Edward was king for one year. He was not crowned. So the coronation that had been planned was held for his brother, who ruled as George VI. When George VI heard that his brother was going to abdicate, he came home very distraught. And Elizabeth and Margaret, her sister, were looking over the balcony. And Margaret said, does this mean that you'll be queen, Lily Bed? Elizabeth <laughs> replied, yes, I suppose so. She instantly became one of the most popular celebrities in the world. Prince Charles in the public made light of it. In private, he was quite jealous. I wonder whether George has in any sense started realizing who he is and what one day he will become. Well, as far as we're concerned, within our sort of family unit, we are a normal family, you know. I love my children the same way any father does, and I hope George loves me the same way any son does to his father. There'll be a time and a place to, to bring George up and, you know, understand you know, how he fits in, in the world. The people who are going to fascinate us going forward are going to be those children, particularly George, he will become the king of England some. You have a very clear line of succession, which is something, of course, the British monarchy is always concerned about. The 2013 Succession to the Crown Act made birth order the criteria for succession. It no longer made sense for males to take precedence over females. Had George VI had a boy, the boy would have become the heir presumptive. But because she was the eldest child and there were no boys. Elizabeth. For the first 10 years of Elizabeth's life, she wasn't expected to be queen. She had a very tight bond with her parents and her sister Margaret. Her father spoke of them as us four. They were this enormously close and affectionate family unit. 
Elizabeth's father, George VI, was himself a very dutiful king. George VI and Queen Elizabeth were incredibly loved by the British public, largely because of the way they behaved during the Second World War. They refused to leave the country when the country was being bombed. The queen was outspoken. She said, the king will not leave, and if the king will not leave, I will not leave, and if I will not leave, the children will not leave. They really became a symbol of that stiff upper lip, of that British resolve. They did live on rations, they dug for victory, they knitted comforts for the troops, and they did the radio broadcast to try and cheer other children along. We children at home are trying to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. The war, in a way, gave Elizabeth a chance to be a bit more like other people. And it was Elizabeth herself who insisted that she should join the services and became a mechanic. That emphasis on middle-class morality and acting as a model for the nation is something she learned from her father. Throughout her life, she's tried to judge what was right and wrong. And her father had been very much the torch shiner into the dark space for her. And I think she's always used him as the template. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service when the Queen said, my whole life I shall dedicate to your service, she really meant it. Something that has completely been at the centre of everything she's done. And before very long, she's fallen in love with a man that she absolutely adores, who she first laid eyes on when she was about 13. This very attractive naval officer, Prince Philip. She had this really wonderful complexion, startlingly pretty. It has been announced officially from Buckingham Palace that Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at night. The future was opening up. Certainly, Elizabeth did not expect to become monarch for a long time. But her father's health had been bad since the 1940s, and that wasn't something that was widely advertised. She certainly did not expect him to die while she was away on behalf of the crown. It is with the greatest sorrow that we make the following announcement. At 10.45 today, February the 6th, 1952, the king passed peacefully away in his sleep. She was very young. She was only 25 when she succeeded to the throne. The combined issues emotionally of her father dying and the assumption of the role of kingship were, of course, bound together. The rulers of Britain have ruled over the greatest empire the world has ever seen. She's queen of Canada, she's queen of Australia. She's queen of 15 other countries. But at the same time, she was very well trained for this job. Here is a woman, her father was supposed to inherit the throne, and therefore she was never supposed to inherit the throne. And here she is, Queen Elizabeth II. think about the period following the Second World War in the United States as being this great consumer moment, a great moment when there's a lot of opportunities for people and they're starting these brand new lives with Tupperware. Freeze it, stack it, any which way. It won't leak or spill. But that's not the lived experience of the British right after the Second World War. Britain, it was so grim after the war. 
I didn't recognize London. There were so many bomb sites. There was tremendous austerity, food rationing, fuel rationing. It was horrible. Rationing did not end in Britain until 1951. The prospect of rebuilding it all again and what was life going to be like. There wasn't a great spirit of gaiety and It brought a bit of colour to the nation, which had gone through the most terrifying ordeal. I mean, the world... Beautiful young queen, handsome prince. It was a whole new era. Here is the news. Mount Everest has been conquered by members of the British expedition. Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest the night before the coronation. It was a joyous moment. And you could see it in the crowds, you could see it in the pageantry. There was this whole exhilarating sense of a new Elizabethan age. I remember borrowing my mother's diamond ring and scribbling the coronation date on my bedroom window with it. So enthused was I. <laughs> coronation happens once a reign, and as a royal ceremony, it does give you a sense of where monarchy is, where the state is, and where the people are at that time. All British institutions that have survived are the ones that have constantly reinvented themselves. The modernizing forces inside the royal family definitely came from Prince Philip's side. Prince Philip is really the brainchild behind the televising of Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Such a savvy decision. It's about including the public. It's about inviting the public into a ceremony that historically had been for the political elite. And it had the most enormous audience. Huge numbers of people bought these tiny little things, and they all gathered around it. We traveled four hours to the Oxford village where my grandmother lived to see the coronation on television. Yeah. I think it did a great deal for social cohesion. I think it did an enormous amount for the spread of the television medium. London, the morning of Tuesday, June the 2nd, the morning of Coronation Day. My grandmother bought a television for the occasion, and people from the village piled in. Into the forecourt of the palace and through the gates comes the gilded coach, bearing the young queen to her crown. Rosie Churchill and I were the only two that went in a coach, and I was just blown away. A huge wave of cheering travels with her, pouring along the mall as though it would lift her and carry her on her way. People were roaring, long live the queen, and it was ecstatic. I mean, the main thing I remember is this crowded living room and the excitement. So, borne forward to the acclamation of her peoples. Our... And took our places. She turned around with a beaming smile. Ready, girls? Madam, is your majesty willing to take the oath? I am willing. The Queen was quite extraordinary. I couldn't understand how she could be so calm, completely unfazed by the whole thing. You only have to walk into Westminster Abbey and imagine all the balconies that get built for a coronation, all those eyes peering down. I should imagine the pressure was immense. The things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. She never put a foot wrong the whole day, not one. The moment of the Queen's crowning is near at hand. The Archbishop raises it high in the sight of the people and reverently places it on the Queen's head. Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, is crowned. happy when we left the Abbey. <laughs> I think when it was all over, she did, she was very serious all the way through. As this day draws to its close, I know that my abiding memory of it will be the inspiration of your loyalty and affection. 
I'll never forget it, never. It was the greatest day of my life. The Queen, who's going to have to do a major job, and she was dedicated to doing it. Whereas Princess Margaret could be more relaxed. She was always a rebel. She'd go clubbing. She'd drink a bit too much. Margaret certainly made the most of her life, behaving in a rather riotous way. She had wanted to marry her father's equerry group captain, Peter Townsend, but he had been divorced. For a royal princess to marry a divorced man would say to everybody, well, look, we can do it, so you can all do it. They didn't like that then. Britain were very pro it. The Queen wanted her sister to be happy, but she could see that there were difficulties. Queen Elizabeth is also head of the Church of England. It's in that capacity she had a really hard time supporting her sister when she wanted to lose all her titles, her allowance. She would lose everything. It was a lot to give up. So I think she sat back and decided not to. Princess Margaret's life was in many ways shattered by her love for a divorcee. There was this echo of the abdication. You know, you have to wonder, are love and royalty really compatible? Kate, now here in New York, you can hear those fans screaming there. I've been such a fan since I was little, and I'm dying to see them. What is it that you like so much about William and Kate? Absolutely everything. <laughs> we're so excited. Yeah, we're so excited. I just I can't wait to see them. The rollout of the royal red carpet for Prince William and a glowing Kate Middleton. I think they've been a nice, refreshing, regal addition to the city this week. No bets were today when the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge arrived in the city for their first official visit. Prince William took a detour to meet political royalty at the White House. The couple courtside at the Brooklyn Nets basketball game Monday, getting a glimpse of American royalty, King James, Jay-Z, and Queen Bee. These days, we think of America as almost belonging, as having more in common with the younger royals. But back when Elizabeth was a younger woman, she absolutely seemed to love that exciting, freer vibe she felt there. And America was very open to her. No one does a wedding like the Brits, but nobody does a parade like New York. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip had never seen anything like this. A million people lined the streets of Broadway. There was just a blizzard of confetti. When Queen Elizabeth and Philip came to America in 1957, were so much more casual and at ease than they were back at home. They attended a football game at the University of Maryland. Queen Elizabeth made a special request that they visit a supermarket because they didn't have supermarkets on that scale in Britain. She talked to shoppers, talked to women there with their children. I think Americans allow the royal family to take a breath and not worry so much about their role. Americans tend to have a more romantic, more abstract view of who the royals are and what they do. Often, housewives romanticize what it would be like to be queen because it would allow them to leave their suburban households and call the shots. You can see that in actual descriptions from women's magazines. At the same time, there were popular television shows like Queen for a Day. Would you like to be queen for a day? <laughs> People would tell their hard luck stories, and the audience applauded, and whoever got the most applause became Queen for a Day. I now crown you Queen Clarice. I think our fascination with royalty comes out of the fairy tales, and especially stories in which the princess comes from humble origins. It goes back to our more basic desires to have a rise above our current station in life. 
They called Hollywood the dream factory. The dreams were ours, and the people who gave us those dreams were the men and women we saw on that screen. You would go to picture palaces. There were uniformed ushers wearing white gloves. You were treated like royalty, and the movies that people saw in these palaces were even more influential because of the environment. Walt Disney obviously had a knack for knowing what kind of mass entertainment was going to resonate. He realized fairy tales and royalty were a gold mine. In movies like Cinderella or Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Disney was able to capture this idea of folklore, of what the people want. There's a princess phenomenon, let's call it the Disney effect, where there's so many stories that people grew up learning and, and seeing, and they see a person who they often aspire to be, right? That they see a person who knows who she is, a smart, self-confident woman who has done amazing things and finds some great life into the future. A Disney narrative lines really nicely with the royal family. As soon as movies became a big part of our lives in the first half of the 20th century, we started elevating movie stars to our own version of royalty. It's not like people weren't famous before. It's not like people weren't celebrities before. But when the movies were created, it was like being a queen or like being a king. From Marilyn Monroe to Clark Gable to Grace Kelly, they were just stunning individuals. Grace Kelly was the most glamorous person imaginable. How else could you top being the biggest star in Hollywood? You become an actual princess. She was kind of starstruck by the idea of royalty. Gosh, a European prince, wow. And so that was the famous marriage of hers to Prince Rainier of Monaco. Grace Kelly showed that, that is when a lot of girls began to believe that it could happen to them too. old-fashioned, elitist, and out of touch. He dared to actually criticize the queen herself. I don't project that for one minute, because you see, I'm now being attacked for having attacked the queen. People say, well, why attack the queen? Well, I, indeed, I mean, it's painful to have to. Well, one would much rather not have to, but this is the dilemma. years, the Queen did have some difficulty with the public relations aspect of her role. Glamorous though she was, beloved though she was, she wasn't very approachable. I mean, to judge from your article, you expect the Queen to have qualities of a wit, would like her to be a better orator, you would like her to be a TV personality, in addition to being a diligent, beautiful and uh, devoted monarch and a mother. What I'm suggesting is, is that in her public speeches and appearances, spontaneity should be the keynote. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey to Australia. Her own natural song is not allowed to come through. It's a sort of synthetic creature that speaks. Lord Altrincham, John Grigg, was a journalist who in 1957 critiqued the Queen for being very old-fashioned and elitist and out of touch. He dared to actually criticize the queen herself. He said that she sounded like a priggish schoolgirl, that it was hard for people to relate to her, that she didn't perhaps sound as if she actually knew that much about anything. I, 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 don't, I don't retract that for one minute. Because, you see, I'm now being attacked for having uh, attacked the queen. He was even physically attacked by a member of the League of Empire Loyalists who said of the fine that he was charged when he was convicted that it was the best investment he ever made. What made it worse was there was actually a germ of truth to this. The queen was this shy young woman. She's the public face of the monarchy and she's a private person. And she's trying to balance these two things. Prince Philip was always telling her, smile more, look over there, Lilibet, look at the children, just to look a little more warm and open. The Christmas broadcast of 1957 can be seen as a direct response to Lord Altrincham's critique. It's inevitable that I should seem a rather remote figure to many of you. But now, at least for a few minutes, 
we see her with pictures of her family around. And it is meant to give that sense of, yes, the royal family are royal, but they're a family just like us. It was the first such royal Christmas broadcast to be televised. She quite self-consciously spoke to the very concerns and criticisms that he had raised about the monarchy being out of touch. We can show the world that we're not afraid of the future. It's really difficult for anyone to maintain mass popularity. The public is fickle, the public is sometimes unforgiving. You have to be willing and able to adapt with the times, especially when there's a social revolution in the air. The cool music of the time was not rock and roll, it was Frank Sinatra. And Frank Sinatra was recording campaign songs for JFK. Instantly, the presidency was covered with glamour. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. John F. Kennedy, in a way, was a royal for the American people, but he was also a relatable man. They symbolized a kind of common touch. People really believed that he got them and that he wanted the best for them. And at 43, the youngest president that we've ever had, some argue that he was maybe one of the most good looking. I was a bit keen on JFK, as girls my age certainly were. And there was Jackie glittering beside him, not upstaged by him. America's queen, as Frank Sinatra called her. A real international star. I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. Jackie Kennedy really embraced a very fashion-forward sense. She says that I'm fresh, I'm new, I'm not going to let anybody stop me. And she really was herself. Paris, Vienna, then London. A hectic round of flying visits for the President of the United States. A half million people lining the route from London Airport to the West End just to cheer a hello to Jack and Jackie. There was something about when the Kennedys came over. I think it surprised us all that this was going to have such a massive interest to it. Crowds broke through at the palace, and once more, the Kennedys got a big hat. I think that the British were drawn to two people who could be a little bit more freer than they were. The Queen was somewhat outstripped by the Kennedys. We're talking about people who transcended their role people who electrified the world that way. Nobody could compete with JFK. The monarchy evolved with some kind of feeling for how successful the Kennedys had been. I can't believe that it, it wasn't in the back of their mind. Just to portray stability, portray the history of Britain without looking like hopeless relics of an earlier era. And in the 60s, they seem to have a problem with that. Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. It was the most horrible thing that anyone could imagine. That this dash in American City was just shocking. We felt it in, in Britain, too. Jack Kennedy, he was a, a president that was, was loved. In memory of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who in death my people still mourn, and whom in life they loved and admired. Here was a man who had symbolized hope, who had symbolized these ideals, and those all seemed lost now. After a period of terrible trauma for the nation, America was primed for something fun and escapist. And then along came the Beatles. 
thousand screaming teenagers are at New York's Kennedy Airport to greet, you guessed it, the Beatles. I remember American friends of mine saying, we needed this after what we've been through. The welcome was just overwhelming. You can't photograph noise, but you can photograph the people making the noise. And they didn't let you down. I got every Beatle record at home, every Beatle record. America became sort of swamped by British popular culture suddenly in the 1960s. And the subsequent musical revolution that rocked the globe. We loved all of it. We loved the music and we loved the fashion. We loved the haircuts. What is it like about the Twiggy? It's free. Americans started behaving and acting like Brits. That was the Rolling Stones. It's just mutual adoration. The brazen British invasion of America. There was nothing like it. The youth, the swinging youth. It was an invasion. Beatles mania swept the globe. The royal family, who you might not really associate with the Beatles, they're a little stuffy maybe all of a sudden the royal family is into the beatles it was only a matter of time before the beatles made it so came the summons to the palace the news got round to the faithful that the world's number one group were to be invested by her majesty with the most excellent order of the british empire the beatles went to buckingham palace to receive an honor a decoration they were called members of the british empire i mean everybody liked the beatles Everybody wanted a piece of that act, but the Beatles were big enough then that that did more for the Queen's reputation than for the Beatles' reputation. It did not make the Royals cooler. It just was an indication of what the Royals needed to do to even stay in the conversation. It's the first time... The monarchy actually, in, in a very interesting way, in the 1960s, tried to get out ahead of this notion that they were out of touch or they were... Um, unapproachable, and they worked with the BBC to create a documentary called The Royal Family. The standard is ready. The Royal Family film turned out to be a rebranding of the Royal Family. <laughs> the camera crew followed the royal family for 18 months through all of their ordinary activities. So we see Prince Philip at Balmoral frying sausages at a barbecue. And we see the queen sitting at the dinner table with her family talking about her day. It is extremely difficult sometimes. So I said, what an extraordinary remark to make, very unkind about anybody. The film was a great step forward. I thought it was charming. <laughs> and I am the most appalling couple. It's really a vehicle for us to see a little bit behind the scenes so that we can understand the monarchy as people like us. Public response was very positive. People wanted to see more of the British royal family. Come around the side. Although the documentary got enormous audiences in England and in America, on the Queen's orders, it was put away in a vault and has not been seen in its entirety since. They realized that if they did something like that too often, they would cheapen themselves, letting the magic seep out. Some people say that this was sort of opened the floodgates and therefore after that all the sort of tabloid interest in them and you know that they would want to know more and more and more let the public into your sitting room behind the sofa and then they'll be over the other side looking at you the problem with all these things is not the, the, the film that gets made with careful supervision but what happens next Exciting breaking news from Kensington Palace this morning. Alarm bells are ringing. We've been on Royal Baby Watch for a few days now. It's happening. Kate Middleton, the Duchess of Cambridge, has been admitted to a London hospital. This is one of the most famous hospital tours probably in the world. Some diehard fans already out there. They have been all morning long. The anticipation is huge here. The world's press waiting for news. We're from Minnesota. Kind of a historic moment. 
People think we're kind of crazy, like a lot of our friends are back home, but we're like, come on, you gotta do this, you know? <laughs> We are just getting news now saying the Duchess of Cambridge has delivered a son. The British royal family has a new member, a prince. So now we're waiting to see if the royal couple comes out soon to greet all those fans. All eyes trained on those brown doors, ready and waiting. We've noticed an awful lot of activity out here just in the past few minutes, so we may see uh, the new arrival fairly soon. Here we go, here we go, here we go. The royal family has just emerged from St. Mary's Hospital. The baby wraps up all. We screamed. We next door was screaming, trying to get the pictures and videos. Like, if, if you can see, it's not just one type of person here, it's everyone yeah, coming together. From all different countries. Congratulations! Congratulations. <laughs> so, we're looking at about 70, 80 years of the baby. So, why not say, oh, when you went a baby was born, I was right in the hospital? That's the feeling you can never buy. Princess Catherine has had a little boy. He weighs eight pounds and seven ounces. We're all very happy. It's the moment so many royal watchers have been waiting for. According to tradition, the birth announcement was also posted on a bulletin board outside Buckingham Palace. As outside the palace, all night crowds are rewarded by the bulletin announcing that Princess Elizabeth was safely delivered of a prince and that Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. One of the great features of the royal brand is that it's cyclical. The royal family is not only a lifelong reality show, it's a centuries-long reality show. We don't often chart a person's life from, from birth to death. But with the advent of technologies, whether it was photography in the 19th century, or television in the 20th, we have been able to follow members of the royal family at every step. Whether it's birth or the first days at kindergarten, this allows us to be invested in these individuals. A heavy program of official engagements prevents the princess and the duke from seeing their son as often as they wish. It is only on occasions like this that they can enjoy the happiness of Charles, it was his misfortune to need his... that she give herself to her people. For six months, Buckingham Palace has been a palace without a sovereign. The Queen has travelled round the world. She reigns not just at Buckingham Palace, but in the four corners of the earth. Soon now, the royal standard will fly again from the palace rooftop. And we at home will say, welcome the Queen. He had quite a difficult childhood. His parents were very distant not just physically, but emotionally as well. Everybody in those early years remarked on how stilted and formal the Queen was. Charles suffered from that, probably more than anybody else. Charles and his mother were subjected to private reunions in public scenarios. But all of this at the end of the day is because of the growing power of the media. Previous kings had gone off to school or had their lessons with their tutors. We saw film, newsreel. Here is courage. Here is honor. Here is Gordonston, a school fit for a king. Prince Charles was sent off at a fairly young age to boarding school, and to one boarding school in particular, to Gordonston, where his father had been. The school had a tough outdoors regime that Prince Philip clearly saw as making a man. He had a difficult relationship with his father, who frankly was puzzled by this son of his who was so sensitive. You can only feel sorry for, for the kid. Uh, scrutinized whenever he appeared in public, scrutinized in private, and then this develops with his love life. In the early 1970s, 
Prince Charles met Camilla Parker Bowles, and they were made for each other. There was a huge bond between Charles and Camilla from the start. Partly it's the things they shared, a love of the outdoors life, of horses, you know, no taste for the spotlight, for glamour. Partly it's the thing they didn't share, the thing she could give him, this jolly, breezy confidence. Camilla was not an aristocrat, and she had had previous boyfriends. She had a boyfriend when she met Charles. A woman of experience and knowledge was not an appropriate partner for the future King of England. He went off into the Navy, he went off to the Caribbean, and shortly after, Camilla wrote him a letter telling him that she was going to marry Andrew Parker Bowles. Charles was absolutely devastated. There was a lot of pressure to find a bride. Many Britons, these are hard times. Britain has suffered one of the highest inflation rates in Europe. For many ordinary people, it's now an uphill struggle to balance the family budget. With all this, escalating prices and an inflation in violence. The late 60s and 70s was a difficult era for everybody in Britain. The economy was in the pits. For the one and a half million unemployed in Britain, the pinch is even more severe. Those without work now account for 6% of the total labor force. And even the longer term prospects for employment are pretty gloomy. It brought power cuts and it brought a three day working week. Just how serious is the situation? Two out of three of the city's workers were working their first and last day this week. We had inflation rates of you know, over 20%. We had a society that, you know, riddled with strikes, with shutdowns. The state basically just came to a standstill. Garbage wasn't being collected. The royal family would be the point on which you would focus your animosity. It's a diamond-encrusted lifestyle that ordinary people whose families had worked for generations could not aspire to. And the monarchy seemed very much out of touch with that. The princess and her husband were guests of honor at a glittering ball. The princess was radiant, obviously enjoying herself. Charles, like his father, is a great sportsman and doesn't miss an opportunity to play polo. People were really struggling, and here we have the family that's living off the public. Our guest today on Meet the Press is His Royal Highness Prince Philip. The recent news dispatch in London and begins this way. Queen Elizabeth has not had a pay raise for nearly 18 years situation that none of her subjects, the working class subjects, would tolerate for a moment. Then it goes on to detail the very high cost that the royal family must sustain on an allowance of $1,100,000 a year. Is that creating an awkward situation for us? Very. Really? You go into the red every next year. We never quite know with Prince Philip when he's joking and when he's really making a mistake. Well, you've had to close down certain large houses, haven't you? No, not altogether. We, we've... Uh... Closed down what we're interested in, we had a small... He said that, goodness, yes, he might have to give up polo. It really didn't go down too well. That was exactly the feeling, that the royals were infinitely overprivileged. I wanted to do something for me. Because look at me now, I'm nothing. It's a rich man's budget, that's, that's all I can say. Make no mistake about this, the ordinary working people are not being hoodwinked at this one. The 70s, I think royals in general found that they hit a kind of rut of irrelevance in the culture. And then, you know, there was Queen Elizabeth keeping on keeping on. London celebrates a once in a lifetime spectacle not to be missed, Queen Elizabeth's Silver Jubilee. 25 eventful and glorious years. Queen Elizabeth II, long may she rest. For one brief moment, the Jubilee seemed to unite the divided nation under one flag. Queen, the head of state, is a focus of unity which transcends any political division. In America, the president is the head of state and at the same time the head of government. In the British system, 
the head of state and the head of government are two separate entities. Every week in Britain, the prime ministers from Churchill right through to the current British prime minister meets with the queen. She can't express opinions, but she can ask good questions. The monarch works to advise, to encourage, to serve, to serve the nation and the government. Once I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people, and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. I do not regret nor attract one word of it. The 1970s were tough times, but people needed a distraction. And this jubilee was just what they needed. Join in the spirit, the good old British spirit. There is an element of escapism when it comes to the royal family. It's a way for us to escape the everyday, escape perhaps disappointment in our own lives. You know, whether people just come out and enjoy the street party and then go home and grumble again about how much of their taxpayers' money is going on the establishment, there's no doubt that these big public events do give the royals a boost. This royal wedding is really about the happy ending and perhaps a new beginning. Charles grew up always trying to gain his father's approval and never quite succeeding. He went into the Navy, which was the service that his father had been in. And I suspect he did that to please his father. The British press, they tried to kind of create Prince Charles as like a James Bond character, called him Action Man. And this is the secret of the Prince's public success. Fly, shoot, play polo. All of these things the Prince does rather well. Gunnery practice is all part of the schedule. He gave an excellent display with a 20 millimeter Orlikon gun. He did everything that other recruits were asked to do, but which actually were quite dangerous. He did not want to be wrapped in cotton wool. His nine months is an intensive period of training where he'll be given an insight into all the pots. There are no fundamental differences between the Prince's training from that of other sub-lieutenants. He's always pushed himself to the limit. Because being famous for having done nothing very important is a difficult thing to live with. He had a real need to prove himself, to do something real. His time in the armed forces in the Navy was an opportunity to do that. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. On paper, he may have been the world's most eligible bachelor. You know, helicopters in a variety of uniforms, looking good, looking a bit more glamorous. But pressure to marry, it was time. There was this kind of hysteria in the mass media to push Prince Charles down the aisle because he'd said that 30 was a good age to marry. And by the time he got to 32, everybody was saying, well, come on then. Well, he's getting on a bit, isn't it? By the time we got married, I think he should get engaged because he's getting older. People had been waiting for a long time to see who Prince Charles was going to choose as his spouse. Anytime anyone was photographed within five feet of him, they were the new princess. There were questions. The kind of dirt the press were looking to dish on any of Prince Charles's girlfriends was things like whether they had a past, whether they'd had boyfriend. The extra element that the future Queen of England was expected to be a virgin. And of course, the trouble is that that was terribly out of touch. The days when any bride was supposed to be a virgin had long gone. It made it a very difficult, uh, tense situation for him. 
Sarah, you know, Lady Diana Spencer's older sister, was widely tipped as being a possible bride. It was when he was dating Sarah Spencer that he actually re-met, or you could almost say met, Diana Spencer. When he finally met Diana, she seemed the perfect bride for him. She was aristocratic, she was a virgin, she was a member of the Church of England. She was young. There were no skeletons in the cupboard. There was no fear of, you know, ex-boyfriends coming out of the closet. This shy, somewhat ordinary young woman who teaches kindergartners, and she's thrust into the limelight. Lady Diana was back at the Pimlico kindergarten where she teaches this morning, but polite as ever, she was saying nothing about her weekend with Prince Charles to the assembled press corps. There was something magic about Diana right from the start. There was just something about her that made you feel, yes, this is going to be the one. Is there any possibility of any announcements of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me uh, if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Okay. Right, but Prince sorry. Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. Oh, <laughs> the public had this view of Diana that she was a fairy tale princess. It was almost that she was rags to riches and she was a girl like us, plucked from a normal life. The reality actually was very different. Diana was probably more aristocratic than Prince Charles. She came from a very old English family. She grew up in a stately home, filled with staff and beautiful works of art. However, the public loved her, and they loved the whole idea of happy ever after. It wasn't clear at all that Charles was going to propose to Lady Diana. And of course, his reluctance shows the doubts he had doubts we now know were all too saying he either had to actually ask her to marry him or he should back off and leave her alone because to keep her hanging on is awful for her and it's going to damage her reputation Charles misinterpreted this thought he was being told he was marry Diana from Buckingham Palace came the news that the whole world had been waiting for Lady Diana Spencer is soon to become her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales Wonderful. Perfect. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I think it's really great. One can only speculate whether Prince Charles's decision to marry her was entirely his own. One has to wonder whether duty and sense of obligation weren't playing their role as well. On the public side of the palace, the crowd watched intently as the interview appeared on ITN News. It was exciting when he chose, and it was exciting who he chose, because it was Diana and everybody was excited about her. It was a really big deal. She was this breath of fresh air. She just looked and felt like someone you knew in real life. Diana, through her teenage years, we know she'd had a sort of crush on him, as some girls of her age did. And here she was, given the opportunity <laughs> to become his princess. Can you take us back to when you first met? What well, do you think about Lady Diana? Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And the royal tradition is that the, the bride-to-be blushes, stumbles and stutters over a few words and then lets the man do the talking. And I mean, great fun. Mm. And Diana, she remained silent. And um, um, I don't know what you think. Pretty amazing. <laughs> She was awkward, she was young, she was unschooled in the way of royalty. Can you, can you find the words to sum up how you feel today, both of you? Difficult to find mm. that sort of word, isn't it, really? Just delighted and, and happy. And then the famous quote. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Whatever in love means. This was not exactly a ringing endorsement. I mean, what sort of person says that to their partner, let alone to the world as a whole? 
At the time, it was like, oh, he's so befuddled with love, he doesn't even know what to say. It was not seen as being the run moment that would later be seen as. Diana came into the royal family as a vulnerable 19-year-old, if they're not handled properly. 19-year-old princesses will grow up to be... His decision to marry her was entirely his own. One has to wonder whether duty and sense of obligation weren't playing their role as well. On the public side of the palace, the crowd watched intently as the interview appeared on ITN News. It was exciting when he chose, and it was exciting who he chose. Because of... Heir to the British throne finally proposed to his college sweetheart, Kate Middleton. It will be the wedding of the decade. Did you see this coming? Was he getting a bit no. nervous and jumping? No, not at all, no. It was a total shock when I came, and I'm very excited. <laughs> And it's a family ring. Yes, it's my mother's engagement ring. Well, I just hope I look after it. <laughs> the engagement ring is a priceless and unique family heirloom. China factories are already gearing up for a royal wedding gold rush. Turned out it by the dozen. It's not an exact copy of the dress Kate Middleton wore, but it's close enough for admirers of the bride's style. It is important for the people to see something of themselves in the royal family, although there's always been a kind of aspirational quality. Meghan Markle mania. Millions trying to copy your most popular looks, so we decided to make it easy for you guys to do it. These are women that consumers all over the world look up to. They want to be like them, they want to feel like them, they want to look like them. Where, of course, the clothes. Fashion with a completely individual flair. She's beautiful. Diana fitted the bill. She looked, you know, like a typical English rose. People were mesmerized by her. But when you actually look back, some of the, the clothes she wore were, quite frankly, ghastly. She certainly has been good profession so far. We learned just how easy it is today for every woman to look like a princess. There is something magic about royalty. What's not to love about royalty? Congratulations! Congratulations! I love the world to know how happy as can be. It's fairy tale time. And in Britain tonight, the fairy tale is coming to life. Lining the streets of London, two million well-wishers. We are sitting in this magnificent location overlooking St. Paul's Churchyard. This is the wedding of the whole world, and the whole world loves a wedding. As you can see from the pictures, people here are shoulder to shoulder and wall to curb. The wedding guests assemble. The huge, cheerful crowd that has waited so long and patiently roars and waves its welcome. Royal weddings and romances were part of popular culture all through the 20th century. But with the marriage of Charles and Diana, they take on a new dimension. The wedding will have an audience of more than 500 million people. That's a sixth of the world population. Quite simply, it's going to be the biggest television event ever. We'll be devoting as much time, if not more, to the wedding itself than we did to the inauguration of the President of the United States. To us in America, this wedding was the closest we had ever seen to a real life fairy tale. This was a massive event worldwide. People filled the streets. I mean, London was heaving. I was in the Scots Guards, part of the Guards Division that wear the red coats and the big black hairy hats. I remember Diana passing where I was. It was a, an almost overcooked sense of national anticipation. You can tell that she has arrived. And here, our first glorious view of the bride. This is magnificent. I have never seen a train like this. Have you? I've never seen a royal wedding like this. <laughs> the dress and all of the preparation, it was catnip to the world. It's a Cinderella story. And she does look like a fairy princess. She wanted it to be so special, and it is. What a day this must be for her, barely 20 years old. And by joining of hands, 
I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So London now sees for the first time their Royal Highnesses, the Prince and Princess of Wales. I saw the Prince in his naval uniform with his beautiful princess coming down the steps of St. Paul's. And I thought, that's the royal family sorted for my lifetime. That's the future, and I like it. It was very exciting to see him come suddenly, you know, this totally different figure with a very different future. Princess of Wales. Perhaps the world's most eagerly anticipated birth. The news of it was announced just over an hour ago. It's a boy. A boy. A boy weighing seven pounds, one and a half ounces, and could well be the ruling monarch over Great Britain deep into the 21st century. When Diana produced her first baby, there was huge excitement. Outside St. Mary's Hospital, those who had waited all day long reacted as though there had been a birth in their own family. And they immediately broke into wild cheering and applause and singing, which has gone on ever since. Are you both happy? 13 hours, long time. No, he's lucky enough not to. <laughs> when William was born to this beautiful young pair who we had watched fall in love, it was the first point that he was adopted by the nation. For some, it was the experience of a lifetime. Oh, I cried, I couldn't help it. You cried? <laughs> I did, uh... As we all now see, that's a very iconic image for the royals to be standing in front of the hospital. But what we have to remember is this is pretty recent. It was a very special occasion. She was the first royal mother to have a baby in a normal hospital. Prince Charles and his siblings had been born at Buckingham Palace. The crowds and the media went absolutely mad. Britain's new royal baby, born yesterday, was today given a name. Prince Henry for short, just plain Harry at home. Everybody loves a baby. That's great. You go more gaga in this country than they do over there. Everybody loves it. Granny was christened in this, and I was. Everything must get so incredibly hot inside there, doesn't it? This is quite incredible, isn't it? Prior to all the, the problems at the end of the marriage, everybody did look up to that family. You know, it, it looked perfect to the outside world. young family, the model first family of the country. This is what we all aspired to be. 
Well, now reports are emerging in the press around the world that the couple's storybook romance may have entered a rocky chapter. This is where the fairy tale cracks and reality comes in. It is divorce for Charles and Diana. Things got so bad, people started wondering if the monarchy would survive. And then this absolutely incredible drama that nobody could have foresaw. There has been a terrible accident in Paris. Buckingham Palace confirmed the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. I say from my heart, there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. Princess Diana shook the modern monarchy. Reaching out to people, hugging people, touching people. AIDS, leprosy, landmines and change people's perceptions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Meghan Markle. Meghan, what's interesting about her are the echoes of Diana. If you have a profile where people are listening mm -hmm. to what you're saying, I really, truly think you need to be saying something that's valuable. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone needs to be valued. She really did hold a mirror up to the monarchy and say, look at yourselves. The anticipation for Meghan and Harry's wedding was like nothing that I had ever seen. Yes, again, this real story that keeps all giving. This beautiful inclusiveness into the royal family. This is a great message to the world. Megan is less interested in the glass slipper and more interested in breaking the glass ceiling. So many girls will wake up this morning across the world and look at TV and see somebody that looks like them. As part of a new modern monarchy. The death of Diana, that was probably the lowest moment for Queen Elizabeth. The British public in London were just going crazy, going, you know, where is the Queen? People really started wondering if the monarchy would survive. And now we have a new cast of characters. There's been a reboot. And people are tuning in. And that tune-in equates to billions of dollars. William and Harry were famous since the day they were born. So they grew up in this this reality that they couldn't get out of. I don't think I'd want to Prince William because everything has to be perfect. Prince Harry knows he's not going to be the next king, so he can do what he wants. They are the future of this institution. The Queen is allowing the royal family to modernize and to rebrand, if you like. Even 10 years ago, if people had said, well, just wait till Harry comes along.